We are in Mark chapter 10. We'll be starting in verse 1. Uh, this week, I uh, read a book in preparation for this sermon. I listened to or read uh, about half a dozen sermons, different sermons from different teachers, and read dozens and dozens and dozens of articles, not to mention commentaries, uh, to prepare. And I don't, I, I don't know if I've ever felt less prepared to preach a sermon. Um, so I guess I'm just not going to study it all next week and see what happens. <laughs> Have it. Um, but the, uh, the, the topic at hand here will be, um, well, we'll just, we'll read our text here in verse one. We're talking about divorce and remarriage, and we've get, got to have some words from Jesus on this subject. Mark chapter 10, verse one says, then he arose from there and came to the region of Judea by the other side of the Jordan and multitudes gathered to him again. And as he was accustomed, he taught them again. The Pharisees came and asked him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Testing him. And he answered and said to them, What did Moses command you? They said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and to dismiss her. And Jesus answered and said to them, Because of the hardness of your heart, he wrote you this precept. But from the beginning of the, of the creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. In the house, his disciples also asked him again about the same matter. So he said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if a woman divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. Please pray with me and pray for me. Jesus, this is your word and we come to it um, as disciples. We come to it as servants seeking a word from you. Uh, we as your church, God, recognize your word to be uh, a gift and we rejoice in it. We thank you that you speak to us in this word. We thank you, Holy Spirit, for explaining to us spiritual things that we could not otherwise understand. Uh, so we, we defer to you. Uh, we give you the right to teach us today. We give you uh, free reign to explain things to us and to teach through me. And we look forward to hearing what your spirit has to say to your church here today. Amen. Amen. So... Um, Divorce, huh? It's a fun one. Not a real, not a lot of ways to put a fun spin on this one. Um, this is not. This is not an easy topic. It's not an easy topic to study. It's not an easy topic to to teach. It is complicated because there's humans involved and specific uh, case by cases. I guess it's complicated. It's difficult. It's painful. Um, and in unpacking the text, I don't want to allow what I think. Uh, what I think is best to determine what I teach as the word of God, because it's not my word. It's not my book. Um, we can allow our emotions. We as humans should be aware uh, and cautious uh, because we can, we can allow our emotions or our experiences to inform the word of God. And it's got to be the other way around. We can't go into this and saying, well, well, this happened to me, therefore, this is the interpretation of this text. That cannot be the way we go to the word of God. The scripture tells us about our emotions. The scripture tells us about our lives. It knows you better than you know you. And it is the judge. We are not. Amen. We don't discard things because we don't like them. Uh, we certainly don't discard things because we uh, feel a certain way about them and... and we have now judged in our mind that we can discard some sort of doctrine um, because of its relative popularity. Uh, we cannot let this discussion be about what we think. All of that being said, I do not want to turn this doctrine into a math equation. Um, there are human beings involved in divorce. There are human beings involved in this story. Jesus is talking to people who have been through things, who know people, who have lives. And this relationship that we're talking about is the most important human relationship. Um, I guess the second most re important relationship that exists following a man's relationship with his God. 
Uh, and just like last week, he thought last week was good. I got to talk about hell. Um, just like when we, we don't look at the doctrine of hell as an abstract theology that we can coldly discuss academically, you know, and just say, oh, this is the way it is, and it doesn't affect anything, really, because it's just in a book. We cannot look at divorce and forget that it is real, it is painful, and it is messy. Um, and I don't think anyone would deny that that is the case, because as common as it is, because it is so common, we all know someone, probably have someone in our family who has been through a messy divorce because all of them are messy. I don't think anyone would deny that this is the case, but it is easy to forget, th- forget that when you reduce a doctrine to its basic elements. Um, when the Bible teaches something clearly that condemns a sin, which this passage does, that never means that the biblical teaching of that doctrine is supposed to be presented without compassion. So, I would encourage you, as we look at this passage, to be open to hear God's word when it is hard. It's his word, it's not ours. We don't judge it, we simply receive it. And as we receive it, be praying that you would receive it in his grace, with enough grace to extend to others who have been through these difficulties. So first, verse 1. Context. Verse 1 says, Then he, that's Jesus, arose from there and came to the region of Judea, by the other side of the Jordan. And multitudes gathered to him again, and he, as he was accustomed, and he taught them again. The Pharisees came and asked him, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Testing him. There's our context. Con- contacts. Contacts. Context. Uh, this, these verses, verses 1 and 2, remind you what Jesus' life is up to this point and at this point. Um, uh, traveling and teaching. That's what he's doing. He's traveling and teaching. He hasn't had a home really for quite some time. You know, he says the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. He's been traveling and teaching. He's been in the north part of Israel for several months. He was in Galilee recently, but stayed undercover, mostly at Peter's house and talked about kids. And then now he's heading south towards Jerusalem. This will be his last trip to Jerusalem. He's heading towards the cross. So he's heading south now towards Jerusalem. He is now in Judea, which you could say would be like the county that Jerusalem is in, or maybe the state, and Jerusalem is the capital. It's a region of Israel. It's the south part of Israel, Judea. And he's teaching. And as he's teaching multitudes, the Pharisees come in and ask him questions. This isn't anything new. We've seen this happen before. And verse 2 tells us, the Pharisees' motives, so we don't have to guess. It says that they were testing him. They didn't come asking questions to get answers. They asked questions to get a conviction. They wanted wanted to find Jesus, trap him in his words, turn him against popular thought, against rulers, against whatever he could. They could turn him against and get him to look like the bad guy somehow. And so they ask him this question, which probably wasn't what Jesus was talking about when he was teaching the crowds. They're changing the subject. We're here now. We get to decide what we're talking about. Let's talk about divorce. And they ask, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? And they had his answer in mind. They're testing him. They're wanting to find fault. Everyone in first century Judaism, and Judaism prior to that, you know, the hundreds of years before, everyone in Judaism believed that divorce was permissible. The question was, under what circumstances? Everyone knew it was, it was lawful, it was possible, divorce is real, it happens, and they, they knew that. That wasn't the question. The, the Jews, uh, ask, the Pharisees at this point, asking the question um, about, you know, they, they say, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? They are under the belief that a man can divorce his wife for any number of reasons, any number of situations, and they probably suspect that Jesus is more strict because Jesus, as they've, as they've seen him, he cares about holiness. But this topic was charged at this specific time in history. Even though everyone figured, yeah, divorce is lawful, you can do it, that's fine. At this point, this year, really, uh, divorce was a, an especially charged topic because there was another preacher around that time, another famous teacher prior to Jesus and during Jesus' ministry, who had been recently killed, beheaded, because of his preaching on topics of marriage, divorce, and remarriage. That teacher was John the Baptist. John the Baptist just recently was killed because, 
you'll remember, he confronted Herod, okay, the, uh, the little sub-king, the puppet king of the Jews. Um, he confronted Herod for marrying a woman who had been married before to his brother. Ugh. So that's messier anyway, all right? So you, yeah, you thought you knew weird families, but um, it was also his cousin anyway. Um, he had confronted Herod for marrying this girl, and uh, he was imprisoned for it and eventually beheaded. So it seems like the Pharisees trying to test Jesus are trying to get him in trouble with Herod again. They already know how Herod feels about this. Be like, so Jesus is talking about your divorce again. You have, we have precedent. When people talk bad about your divorce and you're marrying your sister-in-law slash cousin slash, ooh, this is complicated, um, you cut their heads off, right? Could you do that one again? That seemed to work really well before. So they're trying to get Jesus in trouble with Herod. The Pharisees are also interested in pitting Jesus against the common thought of the day. It's hard to be popular if you degree, disagree with the majority. Sidebar, it's also very difficult to be right if you agree with the majority, but that's another thing. It was uh, always the Pharisees' goal to make Jesus less popular. And so at this time, the majority of Jews of Jews, excuse me, believed that it was lawful for a man to divorce his wife um, for any reason, <laughs> really. And the main debate at the time was what, the, what those reasons were, what the reasons had to be. In Matthew 19, it's the parallel passage. Matthew quotes the Pharisees asking, he says, is it lawful for a man to, justif- to divorce his wife for any reason or for just any reason? So they're saying, they're asking about the reasons. When they come to Jesus and say, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? They're saying, why can a man divorce his wife? Can he do it for just any reason? They're, ask, they're questioning what it takes to get a divorce. And there were two schools of thought on this issue at the time. And the issue had to do with the interpretation of Deuteronomy 24. When Jesus says, what does Moses command? they kind of do this weird, sketchy paraphrase of Deuteronomy 24, verse 1. That's the verse that they're all talking about in this passage. Deuteronomy 24, verse 1. And uh, Deuteronomy 24 is a passage that is, it's really a passage uh, about preventing a certain kind of remarriage after divorce. It's saying that if you marry a wife, divorce her, and she gets married to another guy, and then he divorces her, you're not supposed to get married to her again, because that's just a mess. Um, so that's, De- that's what Deuteronomy is about. But since it mentions divorce there and not a whole lot of other places, it shaped the Hebrew understanding on the subject of divorce. Deuteronomy 24 verse 1 says, When a man takes a wife and marries her, and it happens that she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some uncleanness in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce, puts it in her hands, and sends her out of the house, and then the hypothetical situation continues. And that passage about the man finding an uncleanness in his wife and divorcing her. That's where all the arguments began and continued. The passage is describing divorce, not prescribing, mind you, but describing divorce. It was what the Jews would argue about. They saw that if there was an uncleanness, then divorce was apparently permissible. So the question was, what constitutes uncleanness? There were two guys, two rabbis, Rabbi Shammai, who wasn't popular, and Rabbi Hillel, who everyone liked. Rabbi Shammai said that it was only sexual impurity. He said that's what it means. That's what it's talking about. He says he got married thinking she was a virgin and she was not. He has a right to divorce her because he had been tricked into that situation. And that was his interpretation of that that passage. Uh, It's not talking about adultery where she cheats on him because in the Old Testament, adulterers were all put to death. So that wouldn't have been an issue of divorce at all. That would have been an issue of you're a widow now. Um, on the other hand, Rabbi Hillel said that an uncleanness could be improper seasoning of a meal. Uh, yeah. So basically, you could decide what was considered uncleanness. Your grounds for divorce on that certificate of divorce could be like, you know, I asked for crunchy and she got smooth. <laughs> Peanut butter and crackers is important. You know, that, and that, that was it. And so that was a good enough reason for anything. And a lot of people figured that this is figure that this is what the Pharisees are really asking Jesus. They're saying, and like in Matthew 19, the parallel passage, they say, can a man divorce his wife for any reason? They're asking about a specific and well-known doctrine at the time of divorce for any reason. It would be the equivalent of our modern day no-fault divorce, which is a very new phenomenon. Um, 
So they're asking, what do you think about this no-fault divorce, Jesus? What do you think about this any-reason divorce? And they're asking Jesus what camp he belongs to, testing him for the purpose of getting him in trouble with Herod and pitting him against the popular thought. I suggest that they knew Jesus wouldn't buy this whole theory of, you know, divorce for burnt toast. He probably wasn't a fan of that. And it would have been obvious to them because Jesus uh, was known for helping women, children, the underdog, and those kinds of divorces were generally a crime against the helpless. Um, that woman had nothing to fall back on. She was divorced because she was unclean. You don't care for her because she was divorced. Second-class citizen because she burned the toast. Jesus isn't into that kind of behavior. They are trying to trap him, and Jesus knows better. Verse 3. And he answered and said to them, What did Moses command you? Jesus brings them back to the scripture in question, probably Deuteronomy 24, verse 1. And now they actually have something to talk about. When they say, what do you think? He says, what does the scripture say? And this is a good rule. Uh, this, is a good t- this is good teaching. This is good practice for any Christian. When someone asks you your opinion about something, perhaps a controversial social issue or even a political topic, simply ask yourself or them, what does the scripture say on the matter? And then believe that. As Christians... Um, We have liberty. We have great amounts of liberty. You do not have liberty to determine right from wrong. Uh, God does that. So when there's a question of right or wrong, you don't get to say, well, gee, I've never thought about what do I think about that? Doesn't matter. What does the scripture say about? Believe that. It's got the right answers. You'd be kind of foolish to discard it. As Christians, we are following a leader, a master, and his opinions ought to become our own. Become like Jesus in the way he thinks and in the way he tests thought by scripture. Jesus was asked, what do you think about divorce? And he brings it back to the scripture because obviously Jesus, the author and fulfillment of scripture, is going to agree with the scripture. However, he's not going to agree with their interpretation of the scripture. Verse 4. They said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and to dismiss her. And here you see that the Pharisees, they don't even mention the subject of uncleanness or impurity, sexual or otherwise, that Deuteronomy 24 mentioned. All they say is Moses allowed it. Yeah, but, but what is the rest of the story, guys? When did Moses allow it? They just say, oh, he's, yeah, we can do that. Yes, is the answer. We are allowed to divorce, always. Moses says we can. They weren't taking into account the whole verse of Deuteronomy 24.1. Matthew, in his gospel, he's telling the same story, just uses a little bit different words. He shows another side to this. He records the Pharisees as even saying that Moses commanded them to divorce. It says, Moses commanded us to get a divorce, to write her a certificate of divorce and to get her out of there. And this was a common belief of the time. Um, one rabbi said that if a man didn't get along with his wife anymore, it was his religious duty to give her a divorce. So the Pharisees answer, yes, we can divorce. What do you have to say about that, Jesus? Well, it turns out Jesus does have something to say about this. Verse 5 says, and Jesus And Jesus answered and said to them, because of the hardness of your heart, he wrote you this precept. The only reason divorce was even discussed in the first place in the Old Testament was because of the hardness of people's hearts. And I think we can all agree on this. It's easy to see. Divorce exists because of sin. Sin existed first, and then divorce came after that. Um, There is no such thing as no-fault divorce. There is no such thing. Divorce is always because of sin, whether it is lawful or not. And we'll get into the idea of lawful in verse 11. But whether the divorce was considered lawful or unlawful, the divorce exists because of the sin of man. Someone messed up somewhere there. Someone messed up. Sin exists, therefore divorce exists second. And this is what Jesus is telling the Pharisees. Deuteronomy 24 was a concession, not a requirement. No one commanded you to get a divorce. People were not required to divorce under this law, but they were permitted to do so because of their own wickedness, because of of an uncleanness. The law in Deuteronomy regulated divorce. We have laws that regulate divorce. We also have laws that regulate cigarettes. Uh, It doesn't make them good. The law regulates divorce. It does not encourage, promote, or require divorce. However, 
An explanation of Moses' divorce laws wasn't enough. Jesus brings it back further than Moses' civil law back and goes straight back to God's original intention for marriage. And he goes to Genesis. This is interesting to me and important, I believe, because you think the conversation is going to be about divorce. That's what the Pharisees brought up, and they had motives, so they were trying to trick him, right? So you think the conversation is going to be about divorce, and Jesus instead talks about marriage. Uh, and see, before anyone ever talks about divorce, you really have to have a good understanding of marriage first. Otherwise, you have no idea what you're talking about. And here's what he says, verse 6 through 9. He talks about marriage. But from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then, they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. There's a lot here. He says first that God made them. God made them male and female. God created people and God created marriage. Uh, contrary to much contemporary thought and teaching, marriage is not simply a human invention. It wasn't devised by man somewhere along the course of history just so they could you know, file taxes jointly. Um, it wasn't just a way of sorting out responsibility and kids and stuff like that. Marriage was God's idea and he gets to write the rules. See, if marriage, um, like, say, you know, civil law, other civil law, traffic laws, and things like that, if marriage were of human origin, guys got a good idea and wrote down this thing called marriage. If marriage were of human origin, then human beings would have the right to set it aside as they see fit, or rewrite the rules and tinker with it. We would have that right if it was our idea. But since God instituted and designed marriage, only he has the right to, do, uh, to decide if and when divorce is allowed. He, he defines marriage. God does. He already did. We don't get to argue about that anymore. Uh, he defined marriage, and he gets to decide when and if a, a marriage can be um, dissolved. So Jesus explains straight from Genesis the basic idea of marriage. It is the creation of one new united family. Two people leave their families and the new family takes precedent over the old family. And I would say it takes precedent over all things except your relationship with God. I said this is the second most important relationship that exists. Paul, talking about this in spiritual terms, says that the joining of two in order to make one is a mystery that speaks of Christ and his church. The two, become, the two of us, Jesus and his church, become one, just the way a husband and a wife become one in marriage. Marriage is a picture of that. Marriage is the first human institution, and it was instituted by God himself. It's before parenthood. It's before a government and subjects. It's before, you know, signing a contract of any kind. Marriage was first. It was the first kind of relationship and the Pharisees want to talk about how to get rid of that. <laughs> they want to talk about divorce. Jesus talks about marriage instead. And from his speech on marriage, he gives the conclusion in verse 9, Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. Meaning, it was his idea. He put it together. Don't mess that up, guys. It's a really good idea. It works great. Don't mess it up. The first thing Jesus says about divorce to the Pharisees is this. Don't. Don't do it. It's that simple. Don't do it. He is telling the Pharisees, some of whom may have been divorced and probably have been divorced, seeing as how it was so easy and so such a light thing to do in that culture. Uh, many of them had probably encouraged others to pursue divorce, according to the teachings of Rabbi Hillel and that other guy who says it's your religious duty to do so. Um, and Jesus is telling them, those marriages were not yours to break. You're on thin ice. God joins two people together. You have no right to to tear apart something that he has joined. Divorce, while it was and is regulated, was never intended. He says uh, in Matthew's account, he says, from the beginning it was not so. Meaning the design for marriage didn't include divorce. It just, that wasn't part of the conversation. Then sin happened. And now we do have to deal with this thing called divorce. The point Jesus is making about divorce in this passage is very simple. Don't do it. Now, this is not to say that marriages cannot be broken. That may seem obvious, um, but some people will say that since God has joined two people together, divorces aren't even real. 
um, they say things like, well, those two people got a divorce, but they're still married in God's eyes. That's actually not a biblical truth. Divorce is real. And while it is always a painful process with sin present, it is an effective process. And that divorce does literally separate something that God has joined together. You say, that shouldn't be possible. You're right, but it is. And it happens. Marriage is not unbreakable. It should be unbroken, but it can be broken. Even if the divorce was illegitimate and everyone says that shouldn't have happened, you shouldn't be getting a divorce. You shouldn't, you shouldn't, you shouldn't. When they divorce, they are divorced. That is real. Um, that marriage is broken. Another way, of course, marriage can end is by death, just to kind of prove the point that marriages aren't uh, unbreakable. At, at a wedding, the traditional vows are to contain the words until death do us part. And death does dissolve a marriage. Scripture teaches us that in heaven, we are not married, um, although I'm sure our friendships formed in earth will continue for eternity, which will be great, but we won't be married. What God has joined together should not be torn apart. However, we can't read that to mean what God has joined together will always remain forever no matter what. That's simply not true. Also, although divorce does exist because of sin, there's no such thing as no-fault divorce, that does not mean getting a divorce is always a sin. Now that's confusing, isn't it? Paul in 1 Corinthians 7 says that if a believer is abandoned by an unbelieving spouse, if your unbelieving spouse is unwilling to live with you, you should be separated. Um, that, that believer is free, he says. He's not, they're not at fault. You were abandoned by an unbelieving spouse. They're not living with you anymore. They're gone. Then you're, you're free. That, that, that marriage is, is done and you're, you're free. Um, that divorce still took place because of sin. An unbeliever abandoning his or her spouse. That's wrong. That's wrong. Marriage is supposed to be forever. It's supposed to be in love. It wasn't. This guy left. His believing wife is still there. She's not in sin. She's not in sin. Uh, 1 Corinthians 7 teaches that pretty clearly. Also, in a more specific case, you can consider the parents of Jesus. Uh, you know the Christmas story. Um, Joseph finds out that his wife, who he, he's engaged to her, and we have trouble thinking of that, but they're, they're legally married. They just haven't had a wedding service, and they, uh, they haven't been together yet. Um, but they are legally married, and Joseph finds out that his wife, Mary, is pregnant, and he knows it wasn't him. Okay, So he finds out she's pregnant, and it says in Matthew 119, Joseph, her husband, being a just man, is saying he's the good guy in this story. He's making a good decision. Being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example was minded to put her away, that's divorce, secretly. He would have been right to do so. That's the uncleanness Deuteronomy 24, one was talking about. He's like, oh yeah, we're married, but we haven't slept together yet, but she's already pregnant. I, don't, I did not sign up for this whole thing. But he didn't want to have her killed. He was going to put her away quietly and make the divorce not this big public thing. And it says that he was a righteous man and a just man. He would have not been in sin uh, if he had gone through that divorce. Of course, there was more to the story in that situation, and there was no sin involved. Um, but there are cases when there is a victim who is innocent. Um, just for another kind of strange Old Testament precedent, in Exodus 21, it's a strange passage about wives that you buy, not to be recommended. Um, again, this is regulated, not recommended, but it was going on then. And there was a law actually requiring a man to give his wife this wife says, yes, you, you, know, you came in, you, you bought a slave, but then you married her. Well, if she's your wife, if you don't feed her, if you don't provide her clothes, and if you do not love her, then she leaves and gets the money back. And that's fine. That was an Old Testament um, you know, uh, situation where neglect was lawful grounds for her to leave. Um, a man was required to love his wife. That's still required of us now. Um. The New Testament doesn't address that, so it's a touchy, you know, it's a different kind of subject. You have to be really careful about it. It's a weird passage, but it does go to show that there are exceptions. Divorce is always the result of sin, but divorce itself does not always guarantee that both parties sinned in divorcing. Squares and rectangles. Um, and just in, in case some of you may still have a problem with that idea that, you know, you can be a divorced person and not have that divorce prove that you're a sinner, I'd like to introduce you to uh, someone in Scripture who I'm very close with. His name is God. Um, and in the Old Testament, Jeremiah chapter 3, God is speaking through his prophet Jeremiah to Judah. 
um, Judah would be like Judea. It's like the southern part of Israel, right where Jesus is. And this is after the 10 northern tribes of Israel had gone into exile. They were judged for their sin. Assyria had taken them away captives. Um, and God is pleading with Judah, the leftovers, not to follow suit. He's saying, don't be like them. Don't be like them. And Jeremiah 3 verse 6 says, The Lord said also to me in the days of Josiah the king, Have you seen what backsliding Israel has done? She has gone up on every high mountain and under every green tree, and there played the harlot. And I said, after she had done all these things, return to me. But she did not return, and her treacherous sister Judah saw it. Then I saw that for all the causes for which backsliding Israel had committed adultery, I had put her away and given her a certificate of divorce. God is a divorced person. Did God sin? Not on your life. (laughs) Not on your life. Um, Does God hate divorce? Yes. Malachi 2 verse 16 says, The Lord God of Israel says that he hates divorce, for it covers one's garments with violence. He hates it every time. And he's done it. And he's done it without sin. God hates divorce not simply as a process or a legal proceeding. Like, oh, you signed your name. Now I really don't like you. That's not what he hates it because of all the devastating consequences and sinful causes of it. It's, it's a, sin is involved here. Yes, it's worthy of hatred. He hates that Israel cheated on him with other gods um, in the, you know, the most disgusting ways. He hates that Israel did those things that earned itself a certificate of divorce. He hates it every time he sees two married people get a divorce. He hates it. But please know this. If you have been divorced, this does not mean he hates you. What Jesus has said to the Pharisees is this. God made marriage. It's not yours. Don't mess with it. Divorce exists because of sin. You're not supposed to glory in that. Don't separate what God has joined together. That's all he told the Pharisees. And as you see with the conversations Jesus has with the Pharisees, he never really goes into a deep study with them because they're not asking questions to find answers. They're asking questions to find fault. So he's, he doesn't put a lot of, uh, he doesn't invest in those conversations. He gives them just enough to get them at arm's distance again and then goes and then talks with the curious people, his disciples, and explains things further maybe. So Jesus is going to take the conversation a little further with the disciples, but even with them, he's still not providing everything there is to know about the subject. He's correcting their faulty thought, the burnt toast divorce um, thought. This is... Uh, when it's really helpful to have Paul's explanation on these things as well. So we look at the whole counsel of God to get the the big picture. And uh, we will be in 1 Corinthians 7 uh, shortly. But Jesus and his disciples talk things over in verse 10 and 11. uh, 10, 11, and 12, actually. It says, And in the house, the disciples also asked him again about the same matter. The same matter being, so we can divorce for any reason, right? Like, they thought the same thing. They were all under the same impression that, you know, if, if your wife was late with breakfast, you could divorce her, and that's fine. So they're asking about this. We must have heard you wrong, Jesus, because this is still okay, right? So they're asking the same thing. So he said to them, verse 11, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if a woman divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. This is so much harder than even the first verses that I was teaching on. Um, The Pharisees asked about divorce. Jesus talks instead about marriage. And now he's talking to his disciples about remarriage after divorce. Here's another tricky one we need to be careful about. There are those who see this verse and verses like it and say, remarriage under any circumstances is always wrong. Uh, What's worse than that are people who see this, who have been married and divorced and remarried, or have been married and divorced and would like to get married again, and see this verse and say, is this saying I can't be remarried? I don't care. I'm going to anyway. There has to be a problem with the text. The first is a dangerous kind of ignorance. You need to look at the whole counsel of God and see what it really talks about at remarriage. The second is a dangerous kind of arrogance. Tread carefully. Um, we need to look at this matter in the light of the whole counsel of God, and we need to be reading it with the knowledge that what the Scripture says are true, and it demands our obedience regardless of how we feel about it. And if there are sins that need to be repented of, then by all means repent. 
Uh, so before we even go into this further, let me ask you a what if question. Paul does this here and there. He does this in Romans where he says, what if God made people just for hell, just to show his mercy by contrast? What would you do about that? Now, I do believe that is a hypothetical. It's a what if question. It's saying, what would you think? Does that put you in any position to say, nope, oh, God's wrong. Don't believe in him anymore. It doesn't, does that put you in a place where you as the clay can question the potter? No, it does not. That's the point of a what if question. What if God says something you don't like? Does that give you the clay, the right to tell God, the potter, how to do his job? No, it does not. Check your heart, please. Uh, some of you may not like this verse because it seems to encroach on someone's liberty. And you're thinking of someone, or perhaps yourself, you've been divorced, you want to or have been remarried, and now you're reading that you maybe can't, or maybe that was wrong. No one told you that. You won't be able to understand this passage until you are in a place where you can say, regardless of the outcome, thy will be done. So first, check your heart. On the flip side of that, if you have told people you can never remarry, uh, I don't doubt that you've spoken that out of your understanding of the scriptures, but at the same time, you won't be able to understand what the Bible says about these topics until you come to a place where you can say, Lord, show me if I'm wrong. I want to understand this. I don't want to just be right. I want to understand you. Just as a side note, that's sort of been my entire week of study, <laughs> like this week. Um, some light can be cast on this subject from parallel passages in Matthew. Matthew reads slightly different. It says, whoever divorces his wife except for sexual, sexual immorality and marries another commits adultery. So there's already an exception. And there is uh, Paul, there's another catch here. Paul in 1 Corinthians 7 also adds that abandonment from an unbelieving spouse you're married to an unbeliever, you're a Christian, they're not, they don't want to live with you anymore, they want a divorce, you give it to them, you are then free, which most people read to free to remarry whomever you wish, only in the Lord. And Paul makes that clarification. You marry believers. That's the rule. Um, and Paul even says, actually, in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 27, he says, are you bound to a wife? Um, do not seek to be loosed. And that word for loosed uh, is used uh, for divorce other places, meaning if you're married, don't seek a divorce. Then he says, are you loosed from a wife? Meaning, are you divorced from your wife? Are you divorced from your wife? Do not seek a wife. But, in verse 28 of uh, the same chapter, even if you do marry, you have not sinned. And he's saying, I think it's better if you remain single, but because, because times are tough. And he talks about it in chapter 7. But remarriage, where the divorce was done on biblical grounds, and where biblical steps were followed, remarriage after that is acceptable. When Jesus is talking about, what Jesus is talking about in Mark um, is when a divorce is done without proper grounds, meaning, you know, uh, burnt toast, there's burnt toast, there's a divorce, there's divorce without sexual immorality, meaning there's no uh, real sin on either part except you wanting to divorce your wife. That's the sin. It says in, in that case, you divorce your wife and you go marry another person, you are now in an adulterous relationship. You should, should have reconciled with your wife. That's what should have happened. If a, divorced, if a man divorces his wife, even though his wife has not sinned against him by way of sexual immorality, that man does not have grounds to divorce his wife and is in sin. Now, remember what the Pharisees were talking about. What are the reasons for divorce? And if, the, um, and if the wife has a faithful husband but divorces him and marries another, while that marriage would be real and binding, uh, she has committed adultery. Do you know why? Because now there are three people who are alive who have all had sex with each other, and that's not okay. It ruins the picture of Christ in the church. You've broken it. It's a bad, it's a broken marriage. It's not the ideal. The ideal from the beginning, remember he said one man, one woman for life until death do you part. When you mess with that, it's because of sin. There's sin somewhere in the picture. It's not okay. In the case of adultery, the innocent party would have been free to remarry. According to Hebrew law, divorce, like I said, wouldn't have been the issue because the adulterers would have been killed. And if widows are encouraged to remarry in scripture, if your spouse has died, Paul says, I, I encourage the younger, woman's, younger women to remarry, love their husbands, raise a family, and not just be busybodies running over to my house all the time. And, you know, and then he, yeah, I think he had a pet peeve. But, um, so the adultery in a marriage wasn't an issue because the adulterers would have been killed. 
and the widow would have been free to remarry. Um, Paul encourage yeah Paul encourages widows to remarry no question there but in case in the cases where you divorce your spouse even when there is no sexual sin and then you go and marry someone else the scripture never speaks of that well it never does is the second marriage binding absolutely that is a real marriage and all the rules of marriage apply to it. You love your wife. You love your husband. It's until death do you part. Absolutely. Uh, was it right? Well, if the divorce was wrong and steps were not taken after that divorce to make it right, then that second marriage is lacking the foundation that it needs. And again, this isn't easy stuff. Uh, it just comes up with uh, just to come up with rules is easy. To take these principles of Scripture and try and apply them to a huge variety of situations with wisdom, truth, and cl clarity, that's, uh, that's a lot more difficult. It's hard work, and it sometimes end, ends up with uh, people being upset. You may have more questions now than when we began, so I want to run through a few hypotheticals so we can apply this stuff to situations we might recognize. Easy one first. Let's say two Christians get married. They realize they don't really like each other anymore. Can they get a divorce? No. That's easy. I'm glad we can have one we can agree on. No. Uh, they can and should receive counseling from older, wiser couples, and they should be involved in their local church, and they should be focusing in on their walks with Jesus. If their walk with Christ is strong, their marriage will follow. These are two Christians we're talking about. Okay? Divorce is not an option. It is not an option. How about a little harder one? Two Christians get married. And down, the road, there, down the road, there is sexual infidelity. Should they get a divorce? That depends. They are allowed a divorce, but it is not required. Christians are never required to get a divorce. Is there repentance? These are questions you need to ask. I mean, we are called to peace, and that one depends, and I'll tap into that a little bit later. Let's go to one even harder. Same story. Two Christians get married. There is sin. For this argument, let's say it's not sexual. It's more like verbal abuse. It's emotional distance. It's just that one of you is really crazy. Okay? Uh, what do we do with that? And this is where people slip up and let their emotions or their doctrinal dogmatism get in the way of using some sense. Some people will say, leave them that scumbag, just get out of there do with what, and take whatever you can get. Okay, other people will say, stick, stick it out indefinitely in the home and suffer as best you can for the rest of your life. Okay, there's another option here, and it's Matthew 18. Remember, I said that these were two Christians. Matthew 18 says that if a brother sins against you, you go to him. If that doesn't work, you take two or three people from the church. Confront the sinner. If that person will not change, they're being watched now by several people in the church. If that doesn't change, then you bring the elders of the church into the situation. It becomes official church business. Um, the elders of the church are called to rebuke the, uh, the offender, which might be both of you. Um, <laughs> and if that rebuke is not heeded, guess what? You treat that person like an unbeliever and you cast them out of church. Now we're in a completely different situation because this started with two Christians not getting along and someone was sinning. Now we've got a situation where there's one person which you label as an unbeliever because they are in an unrepentant sin and have been confronted three times by different people and they are continuing in their sin. If, if they are unwilling to live with that other spouse, that is lawful grounds for divorce. If Matthew chapter 18 were followed out, a whole lot of marriages could be saved. Because um, when one person sins against another in a marriage, it's suddenly secret and private. Uh, if it wasn't, and if there was accountability and, and the authority of the scripture brought by the church was applied to marriages in trouble, um, most, I would say many, if not most, Christian marriages that do end in divorce would not. One more, and this is probably the most difficult. What if he's hitting you? Okay, people often ask the wrong question with this one. It's not necessarily, should I stay? It's, why isn't he in prison? That should be the first question. It's not, okay, the simple answer is, you know, if it's, let's, for our situation, let's say the guy's the abuser, though it is actually almost equally split, surprisingly, statistically. 
um, for uh, child abuse and um, spousal abuse. If your wife uh, it is getting hit by you and the kids, she should leave you. <laughs> that's, that's the fact. Uh, you remove from the situation. Does, that doesn't answer all the questions, does it? Is that grounds for divorce? Is a victim of abuse free to remarry? The scripture isn't really clear. Now, obviously, if the person has professed faith in Christ, then the church should be involved in the Matthew 18 discipline process. And if not, then that guy should be in prison. Even if so, he should, he should be in prison. And some would say that's abandonment. Again, that's very dangerous ground to tread on because you don't want to add to the word of God. Um, but the, uh, the best verse I can find for those tricky situations is this. It's 1 Corinthians 7, verse 10 and 11. It says, Now to the married I command, yet not I but the Lord. Paul is quoting Jesus from the Gospels, in other words. A wife is not to depart from her husband, but even if she does depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. That's what the Bible says. If divorce happens, if separation happens, meaning, yes, if, if there's abuse going on, you need to get out of the situation. If you're out there uh, alone, then you should stay unmarried unless proper grounds for divorce have been uh, laid down so that you can either be reconciled to your husband um, or else just uh, remain, single, remain single until there is an actual, actual grounds for divorce, marital unfaithfulness, sexual infidelity, abandonment by an unbeliever. Here's the thing. This is the summary here. Marriage is divinely ordained. It is beautiful. It is binding. It is good. It is the model of Christ in the church and nothing else is. Uh, divorce always stems from sin somewhere along the line, but it is not necessarily sinful for all parties involved. Divorce does always break a marriage, but it is never necessary among believers. If the, if the divorce was lawful, so is remarriage, af remarriage following the divorce. Um, and finally, divorce and sinful remarriage are not unforgivable sins. Uh, it is not a light thing to discount the word of God and just shut your ears to it, but God's grace is no light thing either, and he covers sin completely. Uh, to the married, stay married, obviously, and don't think you're above falling. Those who, stay, who stand, take heed lest you fall. You're not above sexual temptation or simply an attitude of apathy towards your spouse that can just dissolve your marriage. To the divorced, Repent if your divorce was sinful. Look at the scripture for yourself and find out. Either way, know that the book of life doesn't have a D next to your name. Um, you know, it's not like you're a second class Christian at this point. Grace is grace. Uh, a wom the woman at the well who was divorced five times and living with her boyfriend became a very effective missionary. If you have sin, repent of it. If you have repented of your sin, know that you're forgiven already and don't stew on it. And I'd say that's a good, advi that's a good bit of advice for each one of us, uh, no matter what kind of sin it was. So there's that. I'm done. Let's pray. Jesus, you forgive sin and we thank you for it. Um, and you care about holiness and we thank you for that. Lord Jesus, we, uh, we praise you for being good. Uh, we love to, to just read about you even in the Gospels and see how you answer and the, the wisdom that you share. And I pray for, for you to share your wisdom with us just as we mull these things over in our mind. God, I want to pray for your church here in North Fork. Um, God, I want to I pray for the marriages here that are intact, that they would be more than that, that they would be strong. Um, I pray for each husband and each wife that they would love each other, that the husbands would be loving their wives as Christ loved the church, and that the wives would be respectful of their husbands. God, I pray for those who have been divorced uh, and now have more questions than ever. Uh, your word is sweet. Your law is sweet. And I pray that you would 
uh, speak clearly to them and that uh, just we as your church, God, would be able to support each other. I pray for um, I pray for marriages that have been broken or are on the rocks that you would strengthen them and bring us to peace. It is your desire for reconciliation and for peace. So bless your church. We thank you for your truth and ask you to let it sink deep into our hearts and affect the way we think and the way we live. In Jesus' name, amen.